So welcome to the Climate Transformation Summit. And we are really, really honored to have our first keynote um, opening up the summit and like telling us how to turn a climate crisis into a climate transformation or rather to show us what the facts are and where we stand right now. And I'm going to look a little bit to my notes to like introduce him the right way. But you might know him already, um, Professor Dr. Stefan Ramsdorf, who is the head of Earth System Analysis at Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact. He is one of the most known climate researchers in Germany, and he has been one of the lead authors of the IPPC report back in 2007. Um, he's amongst the most quoted scientists in his field and was considered uh, one of the most uh, yeah, leading scientists in the field of global warming and its consequences. I'm super honored to have Stefan today with us. I'm going to invite him on stage right now. So welcome, Stefan. How are you? Hello. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, we are super honored to have you, and I guess everyone is excited to listen in. Um, I just gonna listen in the background and um, yeah, gonna follow whatever you have to share, and then I just come back in the end of your keynote. So stage is all yours. Um, whenever you can share the slides, I gonna disappear to leave the stage for you. Yes, hello everybody. Um, I want to. I kind of bring you the bad news, so to say. I have to apologize for that uh, from the start. Uh, it's a role we climate scientists unfortunately have. And um, I want to start with a, a historic quote. Uh, Alexander von Humboldt, the famous German explorer, was uh, one of the first, or maybe the first, uh, who wrote that humans are changing the climate, quote, by cutting down forests and by releasing large amounts of steam and gas at the center's of industry. He may have known the greenhouse effect because that was already described in 1824 by Joseph Fourier, but Humboldt couldn't know which gases actually cause it because uh, that was only shown in the 1850s. And see, he didn't have a detailed understanding of the energy budget of our planet Earth, which determines the global temperature um, as we have it today because uh, these energy flows are constantly measured. On the left-hand side, you see the incoming solar radiation, and you see part of it is uh, uh, reflected by clouds or by bright surfaces uh, like snow and ice. Part of it is absorbed. And this heat we constantly have to get rid of. Uh, otherwise, we would overheat uh, very quickly on, on this Earth. And that's done by long-wave radiation which every physical body emits depending on its temperature. So the Earth warms up to a point where the outgoing long wave radiation will balance the absorbed solar radiation. And um, the problem with the outgoing long wave radiation is that the atmosphere is not transparent to it. It gets uh, absorbed along the way in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases. And uh, that actually was already known uh, in 1859 by John Tyndall, who already wrote that the atmosphere lets in the sunlight, but it prevents the thermal radiation from leaving. And uh, most of that thermal radiation is coming back. That's the far right button uh, uh, arrow. And um, you can see this is uh, 300 40 watts per square meter, and that's more than twice the amount of solar radiation absorbed at the Earth's surface. So this is really the biggest control knob that we are turning now by increasing our greenhouse gases. And all these numbers are measured constantly. We have a global radiation network on the ground, and we have satellite missions that constantly measure how much solar radiation is coming in and how much long wave radiation is going out. So there's no doubt about this. And the problem indeed is that we are turning this temperature control knob uh, up by adding greenhouse gases. The most important one, which makes the majority of the effect, is the carbon dioxide. And here you see the, the dramatic increase in the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere. 
And if you look at those year numbers, you can realize that this is also accelerating how fast the, the amount in the atmosphere increases. And of course, that's because the emissions are actually increasing. And so CO2 rises ever faster in our atmosphere. And uh, what we have added so far causes a, a climate warming by two watts per square meter of Earth's surface. Uh, this is where the heat energy comes from that is actually heating up our planet. And the result is this. Uh, you will all know this picture by now. The warming stripes here is uh, the normal curve added there, how you would uh, traditionally show data. And uh, there you see on the scale on the left that we are now at 1.2 degrees global warming compared to the late 19th century. This warming was predicted before it was observed. The first official government report about global warming was a Revell report from 1965 uh, made on uh, behalf of the US President Lyndon B. Johnson. And this report warned about the, the and uh, the coming global warming due to using fossil fuels. And uh, a couple of decades later, in 1988, the famous climate scientist from NASA, Jim Henson, uh, said global warming has begun in a Senate uh, hearing. So he, he was saying that what has long been predicted by climate scientists is now clearly discernible in the observations. I was a PhD student at the time, and I very clearly remember uh, this day when Jim Hansen basically says, uh, what we have long predicted is now happening, we see it. It's outside the range of natural variability, what we're now seeing with global temperature. And since then, of course, global warming has continued exactly as predicted by Jim Hansen and by others uh, since quantitatively, actually since the 1980s. And then 1990, we had the first IPCC report. 1992, the Earth Summit in Rio started on the 3rd of June. So uh, tomorrow is the 30th anniversary of the Earth Summit, where the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was unanimously passed with the goal of preventing a dangerous climate change. So the, the world's nations decided to stop global warming 30 years ago. Unfortunately, as you see in the temperature curve, uh, they haven't actually done that. We often get asked how much of the modern warming is due to human activities. And the simple answer is about 100%. Uh, this is from the latest IPCC report, similar result you could see uh, seven years ago in the previous IPCC report. The amount of observed warming is practically equal to the amount of human-caused warming. And naturally, in the last 50 years, we would probably uh, have seen a very slight cooling because the solar activity uh, has been trending down over the last 50 years and counteracted a little bit of the warming that we have caused. We can also put this in a long-term paleoclimatic perspective. I've been working in paleoclimate for 30 years now. And uh, in the meantime, after decades of research with sediment cores, ice cores, etc., we have enough data points where we can reconstruct past temperatures on this planet to calculate a reliable global average. And uh, this, this is what it looks like. We see the transition from the height of the last ice age about 18,000 uh, years ago into the Holocene. The Holocene is a stable climate of the last 10,000 years. Uh, the last 2,000 years are shown at an expanded scale here because we have a better time resolution there from the data. Uh, but you can see we, we have already left the stable Holocene climate in which humans invented agriculture, settled down, started to build cities. And so we've left the climate of the, the history of human civilization, basically, at a breathtaking speed. This is this warming in the last 100 years is at least 10 times faster than the fastest warming at the end of the last ice age. 
and we are basically catapulting ourselves out of the Holocene. And this also means that most um, animal and plant species and ecosystems are not adapted to a climate that is uh, much warmer than now because we haven't had that for millions of years, actually. This is just the, the high resolution picture for the last uh, 2020 years, which shows again how dramatic and how rapid this modern warming actually is. One symptom of this is a sea ice loss and so if aliens were watching us from space they would know something strange is going on on this planet just look at the polar ice cap the sea ice cover on the polar ocean there this is what it looked like up to the 1980s this is what it typically looks like uh, nowadays in the summer and when it reaches its september minimum and uh, you will probably all witness this situation where we will have the first virtually ice-free summer on the Arctic Ocean, which will completely uh, turn upside down the Arctic Ocean's ecosystem. This is uh, data again from sediments that show the long-term evolution of the Arctic Ocean summer sea ice cover, and it's been pretty stable for the last uh, more than 1,000 years. And uh, the dark blue dotted line shows the observations starting in the 19th century and the red uh, line at the end is the satellite data started in the 1970s. And you see basically we've cut the summer sea ice cover roughly in half already. Thickness has also halved, so we've lost already about three quarters of the amount of sea ice on the Arctic Ocean uh, in the summer. And uh, my colleague here from Potsdam, Markus Rex, was the leader of this uh, famous North Pole expedition in the last couple of years by the uh, German vessel Polarstern, and he came back and said, he, we watched the ice dying. That doesn't only apply to sea ice, it also applies to the big continental ice masses, Greenland and Antarctica, uh, where we can measure from satellite um, their, their total mass, and you see this uh, ongoing mass loss of the two big ice sheets because this is continental ice that's being lost here, that actually adds water to the oceans and adds to sea level. And this is one of the main reasons for global sea level rise in addition to thermal expansion of the seawater. What we feel most <clears throat> as humans is the extremes and not the average temperatures. And uh, just the obvious fact is that Heat extremes are dramatically increasing with warming. For example, monthly heat records, or so hottest July or hottest August or whatever, uh, across the world have increased eightfold. So we see eight times more of these monthly heat records compared to a stable climate. Of course, you get some records just by chance, even in a stable climate, but uh, most of the modern heat records are due to global warming. And the hottest summers in Europe, uh, you see here 2021, 2018, 2010, 2003, 2019. It's the hottest summer since uh, the Middle Ages. And uh, obviously, that's not a random distribution. This is just a consequence of this heating. And these are actually the most deadly extreme events are heat waves. The European heat wave in 2003 is well documented, 70,000 deaths. This is the mortality peak in blue that you see here. Uh, when we look at the annual cycle of mortality, uh, the gray lines are the previous 20 years. It would look the same if we lose, use the previous 50 years as well. And um, typically, mortality is a bit lower in summer than in winter, uh, except for this uh, crazy spike in 2003 from that uh, August heat wave. Uh, that spike was even higher than the corona peak in 2020. But not only heat increases, also rainfall, extreme rainfall. We have uh, shown that in a study last year. And uh, this shows the number of rainfall, daily rainfall records. That's the kind of stuff that causes flash floods. And uh, the individual years are the gray bars and the smooth through those uh, data is the red line and it left the, the 
the um, area that would happen just by chance that banned the blue band in the 1990s. So that means since the 1990s, the number of rainfall records uh, is outside uh, random variability and statistically significantly increasing. And of course, it's increased ever further since then. And that is events like the, the German flood. I should probably uh, relabel this European flood because Belgium uh, and Holland were also massively affected by this flood in, in uh, 2021, last year. And uh, as it happens, a year before that, Swiss scientists from the ETH in Zurich had analyzed the rain gauge data from Germany, Holland, uh, Switzerland, and Austria, and already showed that there, in all of these countries is in the observations already a statistically significant increase in extreme rainfall events. And that's a thing that had been predicted 30 years earlier by climate science, because it's, first of all, simple physics behind that. Warmer air can hold more moisture and also therefore rain down more. And also it's what the climate models have predicted for the last 30 years, that extreme rain will increase in a warmer climate. The same applies to drought, actually. Um, this has to do with the fact that the resupply of water from evaporation doesn't actually increase as fast as the water holding capacity of the atmosphere. Uh, so most of the added evaporation that comes from the oceans in a warmer climate actually goes into these extreme events. And uh, there is uh, less normal rain or, or uh, and more dry days. And uh, also, of course, there are big regional differences. The subtropical areas are drying out, whereas the higher latitudes are actually receiving uh, the extra rain on average. And so unfortunately, the pattern that we observe and that was also predicted is that wet areas get wetter and dry regions get drier which then leads to consequences like, like these massive fire seasons that we have seen in California, for example, in recent years, or also in Australia. Um, yeah. And in Europe, it's the Mediterranean that is drying out uh, because it's those latitudes that are getting drier in the warming climate. Uh, this leads to harvest failures, etc. In Syria, for example, uh, which experienced the worst drought in its history in the years up to 2011. Uh, that meant there were one and a half million interior refugees within Syria when the mass protests against the Assad regime uh, broke out. And uh, there is uh, very likely a connection between the dissatisfaction of uh, those people that were displaced by drought and all the problems in the country and uh, the Assad regime and the mass protests, and we all know uh, where that ended. Have a look at the oceans. That's where 93% of the extra heat trapped by the greenhouse gases ends up, uh, not because the oceans warm more than the atmosphere, but because the oceans have a bigger heat capacity than the atmosphere. If you look at the ocean heat content uh, data, these are constantly measured around the global ocean by autonomous uh, floats that dive down to 2,000 meters and then come back up and send their data to satellites. You see that steady increase in ocean heat content there uh, because the ocean kind of integrates uh, and has a big thermal inertia. There is less year-to-year -year variability in the ocean temperatures than in the atmospheric temperatures. So it's a very clear indication uh, that global warming is continuing. It has not slowed down. It's continuing at a steady pace there. This is one reason for sea level rise. I mentioned that if you heat water, you get thermal expansion. That means uh, the water takes up more volume. And that's about half the sea level rise. And the other half is ice melt, continental ice melt. And we're seeing here that the uh, sea level has risen by about 20 centimeters which is already causing problems on many coasts. And it is accelerating. That's again, totally expected and predicted because the warmer it gets, the faster the ice melts and therefore the faster the sea level will rise. And for the future, 
this is what the IPCC projects. Um, depending on emissions at all these uh, different colored uh, bands are uh, emission scenarios. So from low, the green one is kind of Paris compatible, Paris agreement compatible emission scenario uh, that would end us maybe at about half a meter of sea level rise, which is more than twice of uh, what we've already seen. Uh, with higher emissions, we will most likely end up uh, at around about one meter, which would be already quite catastrophic actually for many coast, uh, coastal areas. But there is a big one-sided uncertainty towards much higher sea level rise, depending on whether we destabilize big ice sheets, ice masses like the Western Arctic ice sheet, which starts sliding into the sea uh, and can lead to much greater rise. The IPCC cannot exclude uh, even more than two meters by 2100 and more than five meters by 2150. Uh, I can only emphasize that this is uh, totally catastrophic for coastal cities. And uh, we have to realize that we have enough continental ice on this planet to raise global sea levels by 65 meters. And at the end of the last ice age, I showed you that transition into the Holocene earlier on, uh, the sea level rose by 120 meters as a result of a uh, bit more than five degree Celsius warming. And so with 65 meters worth of ice left, we cannot afford to even lose 2% of that. And just think what this would mean for places like this, uh, Male, the, the main island of the Maldives. Another big risk are the tipping points in the climate system. And uh, this image tries to explain what a tipping point is. Think of a ball lying into uh, this bowl here. And if this uh, human pushes it slightly to the side, it will roll back to its stable equilibrium. But if you push it beyond a certain point uh, where the arrow now points, then obviously it's not going to come back to where it was. It's, it's going to move into a completely different state off to the right here. And that is the definition of a tipping point. And because uh, very simple physics causes tipping points, just uh, push your coffee cup to the edge of your desk and push a little further, then you have a simple experiment for a tipping point. Um, because of that, there are many tipping points in the climate system for the very large scale systems that can have a massive impact on humanity, the ice sheets, the forests, have their own tipping points. The Atlantic Ocean circulation with the Gulf Stream uh, has a tipping point. Uh, permafrost simply has a melting point where it starts thawing, uh, or ecosystems like coral reefs have critical temperature limits that they can sustain. And unfortunately, we're already in the middle of a large scale die off of the world's coral reefs, including the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And uh, this diagram actually sh in these arrows shows what uh, the science is focusing on these days is the interactions between these tipping points. And uh, in this uh, review article in Nature two years ago, we wrote that the clearest emergency would be if we were approaching a global cascade of tipping points where uh, one kind of triggers the next uh, like dominoes. This is the kind of worst nightmare of climate scientists. So what can we do? We have a historic climate agreement uh, with the goal to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degree Celsius above pre-industrial level, level. So these efforts to limiting 1.5 degree uh, are a legally binding commitment by the signatories of the Paris Accord. So Every government has a duty to pursue those efforts. Unfortunately, only a few nations are actually doing enough so that it would count as a fair effort to try and stop warming at 1.5. Um, also, my government, the German government, is not really um, doing enough. Uh, the efforts, the climate policies announced by the German government have just been rated as insufficient by a climate action tracker, uh, which is an, an, an NGO who is evaluating the climate policy of nations. So 
globally, the path that we're on is the red path. This is from the uh, recently released latest IPCC report. That's the current climate policies. The sort of good news is that it keeps emissions constant, as you can see, this is an emissions plot, uh, roughly constant, which is better than where we were uh, five years ago or so, when it looked like emissions would be rising and rising, but it's not nearly good enough. Three degrees is catastrophic and uh, should be avoided at all cost. Uh, one lower down that uh, kind of dark blue path, this is when all the countries' promises that they have made at these conferences uh, were kept. These promises go until 2030. It would be slightly lower emissions by then, but then we'd have to really turn a steep angle to uh, reduce fast to even have a chance to end up at two degrees. A path to, to 1.5 degrees needs to have immediate rapid emissions reductions and cutting them in half by 2030, which is only eight years away. It means that most of the fossil fuel reserves uh, that, that we have have to stay in the ground, uh, only 500 probably for 1.45 degrees. Now it's only about 400 gigatons that we can still emit. Most of the fossil fuel resources are unburnable carbon, or if you have invested in that, it's stranded assets. So what can companies do? I, I really can't tell you how to conduct your business. I'm just a scientist, but just some basic principles. Of course, you need to first take stock what your emissions are, where they come from, including from supply chains and the customer use of the product. Obviously, if you're selling oil, it's what the customers do with it which is the big problem. Make a plan how to get those emissions to zero. I have to emphasize only zero emissions allow a stable climate. And it has to be a time, include a time schedule, not distant goals, but what you can achieve in the next few years is what really counts because of the very long lifetime of thousands, tens of thousands of years of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and this has to be treated as a top priority of a company and commun communicated to the staff as that. You shouldn't rely or at least not much on emissions compensation because the scope for actually compensating emissions worldwide is very limited. And if everybody says, well, we'll do half of it by emissions uh, compensation, it just won't work because there is not so much uh, possibility to compensate emissions. So it's very important to be one of the positive change agents. And uh, as the Fridays activists said earlier on, only climate-friendly companies will survive the next few decades. Oops, it doesn't continue. OK, so kind of hope is provided by the fact that it looks like we are approaching a social tipping point. Societies uh, can also suddenly change. I just, uh, when I look out the window here, this is where the Berlin Wall ran out of my outside my house. Uh, I didn't live there at the time, but uh, the fall of the wall is a great example of how uh, nothing changes in a society for decades and it seems all uh, unmovable, but then suddenly there's a big change and this is a social tipping point. And with the Fridays for Future movement uh, and the rise of extreme events that cannot be ignored anymore, I think we may be approaching a social tipping points where stringent, aggressive climate policy finally uh, becomes a possibility. And uh, to conclude, we're in the middle of a serious climate crisis. I don't have to explain this to you anymore. There is also no reasonable doubt that it is caused by greenhouse gas emissions by humans. Many millions of people are already suffering the consequences. It's not a future scenario. It's happening right now. And despite many promises and some progress, the policy action is still highly insufficient. And to quote the IPCC report, we need immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors. With that, I thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, I'll hang around at the speaker's table later on if you want to ask me some questions. Thanks.
Many, 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 many thanks, Stefan, for this introduction. Um, I know it's not the easiest task to get like the information out and not have the things that people might cheer up for, but like more where everyone is like with a frozen face listening. But um, we really um, looked forward to have you like giving the foundation of the whole summit and like saying in clear words where we stand. Uh, there is some emojis giving applause. So I hope um, that reaches you. Um, to everyone who want to directly meet um, Stefan Ramsdorf, as he said in the launch, there's a table called Speaker VIP. So we definitely consider him a VIP. He will be there for a few more minutes. So if you want to meet him in person, just go there. You don't have to write an email. You don't have to set up an appointment and take the chance to connect. Um, for all the others, we're going to go to the main panel. It's going to take also an hour. So maybe if you want to first talk with, with Stefan and then come to the panel, that's also doable. Um, from my side, thanks a lot for joining in. Thanks so much for supporting. And um, yeah, we're going to follow your work and um, yeah, are happy uh, for or like uh, very grateful for everything you put out in the world and uh, support everyone to understand where we are and take actions. So thanks so much. And yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day then. Thanks. Bye bye.